All right, so welcome again, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us for FuseNet's briefing. Uh, as mentioned today, we are focused on, on the Horn of Africa. Uh, my name is Vanessa Roy. I'm the Deputy Chief of Party for Analysis for the FuseNet Early Warning Team, and I'll be briefing today, but I'm joined by uh, my colleagues in DC who led on these analyses um, and are also available to support with any questions that you might have. So we'll start today with just a brief overview of our approach to early warning analysis and the IPC 3.1 for anyone who's unfamiliar. And then we'll dive into our analysis, looking at the current situation and what we're projecting for acute food insecurity through September of this year. And we'll do a regional overview, but then we're gonna spend the majority of our time on the countries of focus, which are Ethiopia, Kenya, and Somalia. And we'll touch briefly on the rest of the region, uh, Uganda, Burundi, and Rwanda. And just a quick note that South Sudan and Sudan will be covered in, in a briefing next week. So for our approach to early warning analysis, FuseNet uses this eight step process that you're looking at on the slide here. And this is how we project future uh, acute food insecurity and food assistance needs. And so we start by really drawing on our understanding of local livelihoods. And that's specifically how households are accessing food and income in a typical year. And it's this understanding of local livelihoods that then allows us to know what information we need to gather to describe and classify the current situation. And by understanding the current food security situation, we then develop key assumptions about the projection period. And we're focusing on key assumptions that are then going to impact either positively or negatively um, those typical sources of food and income. And as we project the impacts of those assumptions on sources of food and income, we then bring that all back together to assess the total household access um, to food and income and what that means for their food security. So we do that first at the household level. We then do that at the area level and we classify these outcomes using the IPC scale. And then lastly, we always identify events that could change the scenario. So looking at that classification, that IPC scale, this is how FuseNet classifies acute food insecurity. And this is a five-phase scale of increasing severity. And the key takeaway here is that when a household is in IPC phase three, which is crisis or worse, so emergency or catastrophe, this is when urgent humanitarian food assistance is needed. And that's because at these phase phases, households are either facing a food consumption gap or they are only minimally meeting their food needs um, through negative and unsustainable coping. And that means that once that coping is no longer available, they will face food consumption gaps in the very near term. And when we look then at the bottom of this slide, we're now focusing on the area level classifications. And what the graphics here are signifying is that at least 20% of households have to be in a given IPC phase or worse in order for us to classify that area at the area level. So what you see in our mapping. And then lastly, we would just note here that if you see an exclamation point on our mapping, that means that humanitarian food assistance is preventing outcomes from being at least one IPC phase worse. So with that, we'll turn to our regional overview. And we're gonna start by first looking at some of the main events that occurred in the months preceding our current situation, uh, because these things are of course influencing the current situation that we're at now. So you're looking here at a seasonal calendar for the region and it's broken down into the bimodal areas and the unimodal areas. And so broadly speaking, the bimodal areas are the areas that receive two rainy seasons a year. Um, these include the eastern areas of the Horn of Africa. So we're talking about Somalia, northern and eastern Kenya, and southern and southeastern Ethiopia. And these are the areas that have a rainy season that occur from roughly March to June to October to December. And this is also the case for much of Uganda, as well as Burundi and Rwanda. Um, they also have two rainy seasons over roughly the same time period. Whereas in Western Ethiopia, there is one main rainy season um, from about June to September. Um, and in Western Kenya, 
one main rainy season from about February to August, and then in Karamoja of Uganda, also one main rainy season, roughly April to, to August. So during that period of October to January, these months that were preceding our current situation, you know, much of Uganda, Rwanda, and Burundi, as well as that Horn of Africa, had their second rainy season, and they were starting with the harvest of that season as well. Whereas for Western Ethiopia and Western Kenya, that main harvest was ongoing. Now, when we look at how events transpired in Western Ethiopia in 2022, that main season Meher harvest was completed in January and it was assessed to be below average. And this was due to a combination of factors, including lower access to agricultural inputs, um, some moisture deficits, as well as crop pests and the conflict in Tigray that was occurring at the timing of planting for this harvest. Now, the harvest in Kenya was also um, anticipated to be below average, about 10 to 15 percent below average, as was the harvest in Karamoja, also lower than normal. And then in the eastern Horn of Africa, rainfall was below average. This marked the fifth consecutive below average season in the region. And if you look at the vegetation conditions on the map on the right here, you can see that they are far below what is normal. And this is the result not only of the poor October to December season, but also the persistently dry conditions from years of below average rainfall. Now in Burundi, uh, crop production in early 2023 was only somewhat um, below average in areas of concern. Overall, a pretty favorable harvest, and the harvest was average um, in Rwanda. Now another key hazard that's playing into the current situation of food security is, is conflict. And the map here on this slide is showing the conflict events in East Africa. Um, this is according to data from ACLED, and it's specific to the time period of December 2022 uh, through February of 2023. Just a few points we might highlight about conflict um, in, in the region. In Somalia, we've seen an increase in conflict, in particular in the south and the central of the country um, in recent months. And in Ethiopia, conflict continues to occur in Romia, SNNPR, Somali, and Afar regions. Um, and this conflict in, in both these countries is, of course, disrupting livelihoods. Um, and the exception to this that we're seeing really in Ethiopia is really in Tigray, where conflict levels have been pretty minimal since the signing of the peace agreement. And then lastly, would make a note here that conflict in DRC is also driving displacement to neighboring uh, countries of Uganda, Burundi, and Rwanda. And then lastly, a key hazard that is also contributing to the food security situation in East Africa is, of course, inflation. The charts here on this slide are from WFP, and they're showing on the left the annual inflation uh, by December of 2022 and the annual food inflation. And then on the right, you're looking here at the cost of the monthly food basket as of December of 2022. And this compares and how this compares to the food basket last month, as well as the same time last year. And so the primary takeaway here is that the continued increase in food costs over uh, the past year um, is having a notable impact on, on food security. And then with that context of where we were before our projection period, as we look into our projection period, uh, this spans February to September of this year. And so over that time period, the GU or the long rains over the Eastern Horn in these bimodal areas, that rainy season will occur. Um, there are usually livestock births during this time. And of course, the crop harvest will then occur in, um, in the middle of the, of the year in the projection period. And then in the unimodal areas, uh, so again, roughly Western Ethiopia and Western Kenya, main rainy season will occur as will um, the start of the harvest in most areas. Um, and throughout this projection period, you can also see that we will have several lean seasons um, and these lean season timings differ by country and by livelihood system. Um, and that will, will be a primary uh, component of the outlook period as well.
All right, so our most likely scenario for acute food insecurity during this time period is based on the following assumptions. We're expecting average June to September main season um, rainfall. Uh, as a result of that rainfall, but of course other factors across our countries, including access to agricultural inputs, um, the general inflationary uh, situation we're seeing, we're expecting average to below average main season production in Ethiopia, um, below average production in Karamoja. Uh, the main harvest in Kenya falls slightly outside of our projection period. And then for the February um, to uh, June season, so as we're looking at the subsequent bimodal season, the goo and the long rains, we're expecting pretty mixed expectations for this rainy season. And I'll go into that in a bit more detail on the next slide. But overall, as we look at some of the impacts of the prolonged drought, we still expect herd sizes, livestock production, and the income earned from livestock to be significantly below average given the losses from past seasons, the overall poor um, body conditions of livestock, and very low consumptions um, in, in the last season. And in addition to the poor livestock body conditions, we're seeing generally high food prices, and this the combination of these two things will continue to drive lower than normal household purchasing uh, power, so reduced access to food. Um, now in Uganda, the first season crop production is expected to be near average. This is the bimodal production um, in, in areas outside of Karamoja broadly. Um, and livestock and body conditions and milk availability in, in these areas um, more favorable, near average. We expect a continuation of conflict, um, and this will be notably in the areas mentioned in Ethiopia earlier, um, across much of Somalia and in DRC, um, but anticipating levels of conflict in Tigray to remain um, minimal to, to low. And then lastly, we do expect large Um, as well as to Tigray and displacement sites. Um, but there's some differences across countries in our, in our expectations around assistance, and we'll dive into these um, in greater detail in those sections. Okay, so I wanted to just explain a little bit more that rainfall forecast, <clears throat> excuse me, over the Horn of Africa. Because for those who have been closely following the situation, you may know that we were expecting for some time a below average season over the Horn of Africa uh, for this upcoming GU long rain season. And that forecast is reflected here on the map on the left. But as of early March, the forecast has shifted. And that's a result of the fact that the La Nina ended in March. We currently have neutral conditions as well as the fact that there is a um, weather phenomenon called the Madden-Julian Oscillation, and that is now present in the Indian Ocean, and that drives relatively heavier rainfall over uh, the Eastern Horn. And so the combination of those factors, as you can see from the map here on the right, has shifted the forecast for this season, and conditions are now um, a little bit more mixed. So broadly speaking, expecting average to somewhat above average rainfall over the Horn of Africa now in many areas, um, but still some below average rainfall expected in some of the eastern um, and coastal areas of Kenya and Somalia. So with that regional overview, we're now going to talk a little bit more about the countries of highest concern, and we're going to start with Ethiopia. So as mentioned earlier, conflict levels have remained relatively low in Tigray uh, since the signing of the peace agreement. And we're now seeing um, banking installations being restored where there are services increasingly available in uh, across Tigray. Most towns have telecommunications restored. Um, this is with the exception of areas that are located along the, uh, the northern border with Eritrea. But overall, some improvements in, in movement and, ser and services. You can see the map here on the left is showing Fusenet's assessment of uh, market and trade functioning in most areas of Tigray. And while we are still seeing some disruptions, this is a um, marked improvement from, from last year. 
Now, the greater security has also permitted greater humanitarian access, and humanitarians have reached nearly 3.5 million people in early 2023 um, with assistance that we would calculate as roughly equivalent to about 50% um, of their kilocalorie needs. And this is an increase over the 1.2 million beneficiaries that were reached um, between about mid-November and late December in, uh, of last year. And then the fuel supply in Tigray has also significantly improved, and this is um, allowing for greater movement of humanitarian supplies. Um, but we are seeing in some localized areas near the Eritrean border that it remains very difficult for humanitarians um, to access, and uh, specifically Eastern Tigray. Now, in the southern and the southeastern areas of Ethiopia, we're seeing drought conditions really persist as a result of the five consecutive uh, below average rainy seasons. Now, the pictures here are looking at a watering point in Verena across three times that FuseNet conducted field assessments there. So you're looking at July of 2022 on the left, um, September of 2022 in the middle, and February of 2023 uh, on the right. And the bottom graphic here is showing how rainfall was below average across 2022 in, um, in this area. And so in February, in the lead up to this March to June rainy season, the water point was dry. And this is quite atypical for um, this time period. Now, as a result of the low access to water and um, minimal to no pasture during this time, livestock are in very poor condition. Um, this is from a field assessment in February, um, and our colleagues observed that um, camels were producing little to no milk as browse was extremely limited. And this is on top of the fact that households have already lost a significant number of livestock uh, across, across these areas. And then in addition, with the poor livestock body conditions, uh, the prices of livestock are not keeping pace with the um, significantly above average food prices. And so we're seeing below average terms of trade, uh, meaning that households, when they sell a livestock, they are getting um, less uh, cereal from the sale of that livestock than is typical. And the charts here are looking at that for um, for two areas in Verena and After, showing the kilograms of maize that can be bought with the sale of a goat. And the green is showing 2023. Uh, you can see that those terms of trade are significantly below the five-year average, uh, which is in the gray bars, um, and near the very low levels observed in, in 2022. And for many, humanitarian food assistance is then playing a significant role in helping to mitigate the severity of acute food insecurity. So in the Somali region, about 2.5 million people or about 40% of the regional population was reached with assistance in early 2023. Um, we're also seeing that in Verena zone, there's been a scale up of assistance since late 2022 when JOP took over distributions there. Um, and we're also seeing across this zone and in the Somali region that assistance reaching about 50% of the population's um, kilocalorie needs. So while that humanitarian assistance is likely reducing the severity of acute food insecurity, we're still seeing that the high levels of acute food insecurity are contributing to high levels of acute malnutrition. And the available data on um, acute malnutrition is pointing to critical or extremely critical levels of acute malnutrition um, in some of the areas of highest concern. And as the chart here is showing, we're also seeing an increase um, in the admissions of children with severe acute malnutrition for treatment. So with that current situation in mind, I just remind you briefly of some of the um, assumptions that we're expecting for uh, Ethiopia. Uh, below average mayhair harvest and um, uh, below average belg harvest are likely. Um, this will also somewhat negatively affect some of the agricultural labor opportunities that are available. Um, overall purchasing power is likely to remain below average amid the high food prices. Um, and the rainfall forecast for March to May in the pastoral areas is now looking more favorable, um, but there's still large scale livestock losses from, from the previous seasons. And so this will continue to um, negatively affect access to livestock sales and uh, productivity.
So looking at our expected food security outcomes uh, through September, we do expect widespread uh, emergency exclamation point and crisis exclamation point outcomes in the southern and southeastern areas. As noted, household access to food and income from livestock production, which is their primary livelihood, is likely to remain significantly below average. And other income sources will also be insignificant to make up for this gap, given uh, the number of people who are competing for these other income sources, and then the high food prices that we're seeing as well. In northern Ethiopia, improved humanitarian access is going to um, support the continued distribution of assistance. And the local economy is in the early stages of recovery uh, in Tigray. And so we're still expecting pretty widespread needs across the region, um, but crisis exclamation point outcomes, so some improvement. And then in most of SNNP, Sadama, and central and eastern Oromia regions, um, here, crop production is the main livelihood activity, and we expect that they will exhaust crops early um, and be more dependent on, on markets with higher food prices. Um, and so we're expecting some uh, pretty widespread stress and crisis outcomes in these areas. Next, we'll turn to Kenya. And as we highlighted earlier, the rainfall of this past season was below average. Um, with most of northern and eastern Kenya receiving rainfall totals that were less than 85% of, of the 40-year average, and again marking the fifth consecutive below average uh, season with this past one. Now, the Ministry of Agriculture estimates that Kenya's 2022 national harvest is about 10 to 15% below the five-year average, and this is attributed to poor rainfall and high prices for inputs. And in the marginal agricultural areas, the area planted for the October to December short rains was about 10 to 25 percent below average for maize. Now, in the coastal areas where rainfall was relatively better, as was um, seed availability, uh, we're seeing somewhat better harvest there. Now, based on field assessments from uh, the KFSSG, this the short rains assessment that took place in January of 2023. Um, the recharge of water sources from that below average short rain season really varied across, um, across areas. So in the agro-pastoral areas, um, or excuse me, in the coastal area, um, sorry, one second, I lost my, my place in my bullet points here. Um, in the marginal agricultural areas, we saw rainfall that was um, somewhat better. And so here in the the distance that is traveled uh, to water sources is largely normal. And the wait times at the water sources are also generally normal. But in the southeastern marginal agricultural areas, we're seeing wait times that are somewhat higher, so upwards of about 60 minutes um, compared to the typical of about 10 to 20 minutes. Now, in the pastoral areas, conversely, households are traveling on average about six to 20 kilometers um, to access water. And this is higher than the five to 10 kilometers that they are normally traveling. And this decline in water availability is not only resulting in that lower time that they are, or that longer time that they are traveling, but they are waiting to fill their jerry cans at those water sources um, for longer periods of time as well. And in the northwest and the northeast, those wait times are anywhere from about 30 to 180 minutes. And this is compared to 15 to 60 minutes normally. And this is all important to note because that increase in the time and the effort that households must invest in order to get water, that comes at the expense of other crucial activities such as labor for income uh, to purchase food. And then furthermore, the livestock body conditions are poor to very poor given the below average rainland resources and the long distances to water. And those poor livestock body conditions are also re resulting then in poor conceptions and birth rates. And so if we look at the impact that this has had on livestock across, uh, across the drought, the National Drought Management Authority in Kenya is estimating that around 2.61 million livestock have died since October of 2021. Uh, so this takes away a significantly important asset um, to households in this area. 
Now in Kenya, staple food prices also remain historically high, and this is driven by the low local availability um, after these consecutive below average harvests, um, as well as the high global prices. So in February, maize prices in most of the markets that we're monitoring were anywhere from about 20 to 95% above the five-year average. And this coupled with the then poor livestock body conditions, which is driving low livestock prices, um, is resulting in lower than normal terms of trade. And that's what the chart here is showing with terms of trade in February in blue um, compared to the five-year average in gray. And then as we look at the impacts of acute food insecurity and other drivers on acute malnutrition, the global acute malnutrition has declined somewhat from about six months ago, but it does remain within a statistically similar range across most of the counties surveyed. And this overall high level of acute malnutrition is driven in part by that lower consumption of milk um, from very poor livestock body conditions, and we're also seeing high morbidity um, as a driving factor. And then there are ongoing safety nets across Kenya, um, cash transfers that are being delivered, um, and many of these interventions are uh, reaching drought-affected households um, and some of the households of greatest concern. Um, we've also seen various partners who are engaged in interventions such as water trucking um, and the distribution of livestock feed. Before looking at the projection period, again, just revisiting the assumptions, um, we're expecting an average uh, main season rainfall in those western areas, um, but somewhat mixed conditions for the first season in bimodal areas. Um, that low livestock productivity um, as well as low income from livestock will persist. And this is, of course, amid the very high uh, food prices. But assistance is expected to continue to play a vital role. So looking at the food security outcomes that we expect uh, through September in the pastoral areas of Turkana, Marsabit, Mandera, Isiolo, and Wajir, crisis exclamation point outcomes are likely. Um, this will be supported by the um, humanitarian food assistance that we expect to continue. Um, but at the same time as that assistance is ongoing uh, because of the drought and the overall poor body conditions of livestock, low livestock levels, um, many of the uh, typical food and income sources, sale of livestock, access to milk, um, these will all remain uh, significantly below average and not keeping pace with high food prices. Whereas in the marginal um, areas, crisis outcomes are most likely in Kitui and parts of Makueni counties. And this is driven by limited access to income following the poor short rains harvest and high maize prices, um, low milk production and lower household purchasing power. But in the rest of the marginal agricultural areas, um, there are slightly lower maize prices and higher food stocks. Um, and relatively greater access to off-farm income sources. And so stressed outcomes are expected here. Uh, next, we'll turn to Somalia. In Somalia, uh, the performance of the October to December rains, similar to that described in Ethiopia and Kenya, so largely below average, but the season was somewhat better than anticipated um, and better than the preceding season. Uh, despite that, given just the unprecedented five-season drought um, that preceded it, we've seen that most of the natural and man-made water sources um, by the start of our projection period were either partially or entirely depleted um, and a continued limited pasture and browse availability. <clears throat> Now, the ongoing drought is also occurring amid increasing armed conflict in southern and central regions, as well as in Lassacanud of Seoul region. And conflict is, of course, another major driver of the acute food insecurity that we see in Somalia. It displaces households. It separates them from their assets. Um, it can lead to the destruction of markets and crops. Um, and it can in, it can hinder physical ability to many labor um, sources as well as restricting humanitarian access. And so that's a factor that we're seeing continue to play a significant role in Somalia. And food prices, um, if you look at the chart here on the right, they do remain high, but they have de decreased somewhat in recent months in most of the key reference markets. 
And these price declines are driven mainly by the declining global food prices, um, as well as food from the dare harvest, um, that October to December seasons harvest, um, and buy in Bakul, where these areas did see um, somewhat better than expected production. So staple food prices are now at levels that are uh, generally lower than the same time last year. And then, of course, in Somalia, we have seen a significant and sustained multi-sectoral humanitarian um, assistance intervention uh, that has provided a really critical source to poor households and has averted famine uh, to date. And this graphic here is showing the beneficiaries reached with humanitarian food assistance over a relatively long timeline um, nationally in Somalia. And if you look to the right of the chart, you can really see that significant scale up in assistance in 2022. And most of that assistance was provided in the form of cash or voucher um, due to some of the access constraints in the country. And the monthly ration was equivalent to around 80% of households' um, kilocalorie needs. Now, other sectoral assistance, including health and wash and nutrition interventions, also significantly scaled up in the latter half of 2022 and also played a significant role in preventing uh, worse outcomes. And in addition to that, although we do not have um, significant information on the on the quantities, uh, we also know that assistance is being provided um, by Qatar charity and other uh, non-Western uh, actors. And then again, just looking briefly at the um, assumptions, the forecast for the March to June season is now more favorable and this will support some improvements, but given the scale of the loss of uh, assets over the historic droughts, those improvements will take time. And so again, expecting households to have limited to no livestock production or the ability to sell livestock in the coming months and we also are seeing significant debts amongst households, um, which will constrain their ability to utilize any income uh, towards the purchase of food. And so humanitarian assistance will continue to play a really vital role in, in Somalia. So as we look to the outcomes that we're expecting, the out or that ongoing drought still driving severe and widespread acute food insecurity um, with crisis and emergency outcomes expected to be relatively widespread, uh, including households in, in catastrophe. And as we look to the June to September period here, uh, this is when we're expecting a scale down in assistance and as a result of it, um, more widespread emergency outcomes, um, also expecting households in catastrophe. So although we um, are not seeing famine as the most likely outcome, it's important to remember that emergency outcomes are still um, associated with high levels of acute malnutrition and excess mortality. And just on that note, we do want to make a couple notes on the consequences of the prolonged drought on the loss of life in Somalia. So a study was conducted by the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Um, this was commissioned by WHO and UNICEF uh, with support from um, BHA, and it looked at excess mortality in Somalia due to the drought. And in order to do that, the study looked at mortality from available SMART surveys. They also looked at contributing factors and took all of that to develop a model um, that would fit the data points they are seeing to compare what current levels of mortality um, were during this ongoing drought, specifically here in 2022, uh, compared to what they might expect to be a counterfactual. So what mortality may have been uh, without the drought, uh, and they base that counterfactual on, on past trends. And from that work, they estimated that about 43,000 um, additional deaths beyond what is would have been typical for Somalia uh, likely occurred, and that half of those were among children under five. And they were also modeling the potential excess mortality for the first six months of 2023. And based on various scenarios, optimistic or stable or pessimistic outlooks for conditions over the Horn of Africa over that time period, across those scenarios, they estimated that anywhere from 18,000 to 34,000 additional deaths would take place um, in the first six months of 2023. 
And so this work really helps highlight how even with the revised forecast, lives and livelihoods have been significantly negatively impacted by this historic drought. And the crisis is far from over. And so continued large scale assistance is still going to be needed over the Horn of Africa to save lives and to rebuild livelihoods. And then lastly, we're going to conclude with some brief updates here on Uganda, Burundi, and Rwanda. So in Uganda, in bimodal areas, atypically dry conditions have somewhat hindered the land preparation activities for the first season. Um, but the forecast of near average March to May rainfall, um, as a result of that, we are expecting near normal crop and livestock production. Um, and this will really support the um, improvement to minimal outcomes in, in many areas of Uganda. But in the greater northern Uganda, where stressed outcomes are currently prevailing, um, we expect that improvement to occur around June. There are atypically high staple food prices across Uganda. Um, this is, of course, negatively affecting poor households' access um, to food. Um, and the upward pressure on prices that we're seeing in this uh, country is similar to others, driven by below average domestic supplies, um, high regional demand, and high fuel prices. Now in Karamoja, poor households are earning less income than typical um, in, and their staple food prices are significantly above average. And so we're seeing a combination of those two factors driving um, lower access to food. You can see here some of the high food prices that were on the chart on the right um, that we're seeing across, uh, across Uganda. And given the expectation that we will see a fourth consecutive season of below average crop production in Karamoja, we expect crisis outcomes are going to be likely there um, through August. And then lastly, the refugee population in Uganda is expected to increase in the projection period because of the conflict that we're seeing in DRC, um, as well as in uh, parts of South Sudan. And so this is expected to constrain the already inadequate funding for humanitarian food assistance in the country. And in February, most refugees were receiving rations that were estimated at around 30 to 60 percent of their minimum kilocalorie needs. Um, but in the coming months, the shift uh, in targeting or we're expecting that there will be a shift in targeting um, from based on the settlement location to a needs-based targeting. And so this is likely to result in adjustments in ration sizes for refugees. And given this, although we are expecting stressed exclamation point outcomes in the IDP camps or the refugee camps, excuse me, overall, um, we are expected to see an increasing number of refugees uh, facing crisis outcomes with the likely lower rations. In Burundi, uh, the season A harvest was um, somewhat below average, about 10 to 15 percent nationally um, and 25 to 30 percent below average in some of the semi-arid livelihood zones in the north and the east uh, where rainfall was particularly poor. And as a result of that, um, these areas, the populations in these areas are likely to exhaust their food stocks earlier than normal um, as early as March. And so that below average season A harvest there is also a contributing factor of the higher food prices that they're seeing um, and lower agricultural labor opportunities. And so in these areas of the north and the east, um, so specifically that is the eastern and northern lowlands, the eastern dry plateaus and um, Bergani livelihood zone, we're expecting um, outcomes to be relatively worse there. Uh, crisis outcomes around April and May and uh, prior to the season B harvest that will become available um, in June. And then in Rwanda, the season A harvest was generally average and uh, both crops and agricultural income um, from season B later this year are also expected to be average. Now we are seeing um, high staple food prices, uh, the consumer price index for food and non-alcoholic beverages up 65% in January compared to the same time last year. Um, but with the relatively favorable harvests and labor opportunities that we're seeing across the country, we do expect the rural areas to be in phase one. 
Um, we do expect some households to be in phase two, and um, that includes in some of the uh, eastern and western provinces that realized some local below average harvests, um, as well as in uh, urban areas. And then uh, the tensions on the Rwandan DRC border have not only caused population displacement, but have also negatively affected some cross-border trade, especially in the Western province. Um, and so this is leading to a loss of income that is also contributing uh, to some stressed outcomes at the household level that we're expecting uh, there. And with that, we'll conclude with a summary of our analysis for the region. Uh, as noted many times, this historic five season drought, as well as ongoing conflict and the macroeconomic challenges that we're seeing are together driving very high levels of acute food insecurity across East Africa and the Horn of Africa remains an area of significant concern where large scale humanitarian food assistance is still going to be needed throughout 2023. Now in Northern Ethiopia, after the aftermath of the conflict we saw in Tigray and some neighboring um, areas, we have since seen relative calm. Um, and with that, we are seeing a slow recovery of the economy and an expansion of assistance delivery. Um, but crisis exclamation point outcomes still denote there is widespread need even in the presence of humanitarian food assistance. And with the conclusion of the uh, rainy season and the harvest in Uganda, Burundi, and Rwanda, we're expecting largely minimal outcomes um, across most of those countries. But with the poor rainfall performance um, and high staple food prices driving stressed and crisis outcomes um, in northern Uganda and northern and eastern Burundi, um, amongst them Karamoja is of greatest concern. I will end there and um, we have time to answer any questions that anyone has. Let me go ahead and turn off the recording real quick and um, open it up to any questions. Thank you so much, Vanessa, for that wonderful.